Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jessica Deganzik, the Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. We are pleased to welcome you to today's program, A Diplomat's Bold Vision for the Future of the United Arab Emirates. Our speaker today is His Excellency Omar Gabash, the United Arab Emirates Assistant Minister for Culture and Public Diplomacy. Ambassador Gabash has been called the new face of UAE diplomacy and tolerance. He previously served as UAE's ambassador to France and to Russia, and is the author of the book, Letters to a Young Muslim. He will be in conversation with Daniel Eagle, a senior economist at Rand's Center for Middle East Public Policy. A special thank you to Consul General Haza al Kabi and the United Arab Emirates Consulate here in Los Angeles, and to our event partners, the Pacific Council and Rand's Center for Middle East Public Policy. We'll be taking your questions in about 35 minutes, you can submit your question by entering them on the question section on the control panel, which is on the right hand side of your screen. And I'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Daniel, thank you so much for leading today's conversation. I'll turn this over to you and Ambassador Gabash and be back in about 35 minutes to share questions from our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica, and good morning, Ambassador. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the Los Angeles World Affairs Council uh, for hosting this event and all our listeners for joining us today. Uh, I think it'll be a really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, Ambassador, if you're willing, I'd like to start off by discussing your book, and I'll show it here to, to our listeners, uh, Letters to a Young Muslim, uh, written in 2017 as a series of letters to your eldest son. Uh, it tells, a, I think, a really remarkable story of the social, economic, and political transformation over the last 50 years. Uh, it also, you know, it speaks to the youth of today in the mid Middle East, talking about their challenges, talking about the problems that they face. Um, I think reflecting on your own personal story. I um, mean, I think it just offers a remarkable, um, a remarkable story about growing up in the Middle East, growing up in the Emirates. Uh, and I would recommend it to anyone um, who, you know, wants to understand the region, wants to understand a vision for tolerance for the region. So if you, if you, Ambassador, if you would, you know, I might uh, start off by talking about the history, the evolution you've seen uh, in the Middle East, in the Emirates over the last 50 years. Um, as I'm sure you well know, uh, in December, uh, you'll mark the 50th anniversary of the UAE. Uh, a remarkable country has transformed remarkably in the last 50 years. If you could talk a bit about the change that you've seen over the last 50 years. Uh, thank you very much for having me on, uh, and thank you for bringing up my book. I mean, I, I, I assume that it might, you know, kind of last a, a week or, or maybe at most a month, but uh, people are still bringing it up. And I, 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 in fact, recently saw it in one of the bookshops here in Los Angeles. I was very pleased. Um, the, the interesting thing for me also is that I was born in the year of the Federation. So, you know, we celebrate the Federation's 50th anniversary. I just recently celebrated my own 50th birthday. And there's kind of a parallel between, you know, the way in which I look back at my own life and I also look back at the, the way our society has, has developed. Um, I've also started looking a little further back to see uh, the, the, the actual miracle of the, of the Emirates, um, because it really does seem like a miracle to, to people like me and, and, and people who are older. And in trying to explain that to our, a younger generation where um, they've, they've been brought up in a completely different environment. Um, so I've been looking at the 60s and the 50s, and it is actually astounding um, the, the, the transformation uh, uh, of our society from what was essentially a, a desert uh, and very, very tribal society where illiteracy was, you know, sky high. Uh, existence was very, very difficult, tenuous. Um, and, you know, if you lived to the age of five, uh, you, you were regarded as some, something of a miracle. Um, and there is uh, one of our uh, citizens is 105 uh, at the moment. And, you know, he's, he's still going strong. So uh, uh, it's, it's just like a it's, it's remarkable to think that, that that's how we were, and, and questions of mortality were really very serious. Uh, we have a, a family diary where, uh, going back to the turn of the century, where it was just a list of every single newborn that died uh, and the cause of death. Uh, and now, you know, we look at, we look at the, the Emirates after unification. Uh, we've gone through this um, massive process of uh, wealth distribution, essentially, uh, creation of institutions, uh, um, the creation of uh, a greater sense of identity as a as a unit unit of a of a state as opposed to you know being tribal or family oriented, uh, and we've got a whole new generation of kids who are coming to the U.S. and to, to some of the top universities in the U.S. and the and and the Western world, uh, and it's just amazing to be able to see that happening. 
Um, so we've moved from being a very tribal society to now uh, 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 making a place to become a, a global platform, uh, whether it's in the sciences or logistics or uh, international aid. Uh, and just, you know, it makes me very proud to be, be able to be part of it. Um, well, that's great. And, you know, one of the things I'll do at the end is ask, ask you to talk about where you think the Emirates is going um, sure. at the end of the conversation today. But there's one theme where well, you pick up a, one, a bunch of wonderful themes in your book. Um, one of the themes that really resonated with me uh, was your experience growing up mixed race uh, in the United Arab Emirates. You know, this is a uh, something that's you know personal to me. My wife is mixed race, and a mm -hmm. lot of you know, our interactions with the world are through that prism. Um, and I think it's something that probably resonates with many of the community in Los Angeles who have sure. you know, families of different backgrounds. Um, it's just you know you offer a remarkable story in your book about that. I was wondering if you might talk a bit about your own experience and how that shaped your own trajectory. Uh, sure. Uh, so for the, for the record, my, my father is Emirati. He comes from the Northern Emirates. Uh, and um, due to uh, very kind of restrictive financial resources, uh, he was compelled to take up a scholarship in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, innocently thinking he's going to get an education. Um, and, you know, the reality, of course, was this was part of uh, an attempt to, you know, sort of uh, nurture an elite across the Arab world. I think the Soviets had a, a program of about 2000 um, scholarships uh, for the region in the in the 60s. Uh, by that time, my father was already in his early 30s. And, and you know, four years later, he came back um, with a, a Russian wife, who is my wonderful mother. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it was chance, uh, it was circumstance. Um, but what he did was essentially, it was quite quite a, um, a bold uh, kind of breaking of taboos in our region, where you don't marry outside of the family or the tribe or, or, or you know, the, certainly not the ethnicity. Uh, and we have a little document. He had sent a telegram to um, the ruler of the Emirate uh, asking for permission in the 1960s to marry a Russian lady. And so the, the answer came back, says, yes, you can go ahead and do that. And now the, the end result of that was, you know, four, four children growing up in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and I have to be honest, looking back, uh, our childhood was a little difficult um, because we were kind of the first uh, biracial children in, in the area. We certainly didn't know anybody else who was Emirati with, with foreign blood. Um, but, you know, as, as time went by, it began to, to, to uh, present itself as a massive opportunity and a massive resource because, you know, I speak English as a first language. We have access to you know all of our Arab, Arabic cultural resources, yeah, but at the same time, I had the perspective of Russian literature uh, and, and, a, and a Russian mother. So, uh, you know, I brought her Dostoevsky and approach to life, uh, and you know, it served me in some ways, and it's and it's kind of been been tough in other ways. Um, but you know, the, the 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 multiplicity of perspectives has allowed me to um, you know be friendly with everybody and and uh, you know serve as a diplomat in many different places. Um, uh, what, what's also turned up is that over the last uh, few decades, uh, more and more Emiratis have married foreigners. Um, and so now we have, I, mean, I can tell you, we have Emiratis who speak Mandarin fluently because their, their, their mothers are Chinese. Um, we have uh, you know, uh, Italians, Spaniards, Africans, uh, you know, sort of from the subcontinent. Um, so we have this kind of network of young, young Emiratis who are, uh, who are very kind of multidimensional personalities and talents. Uh, and we're bring, we're looking to bring that into you know to to serving the the, the nation, uh, to be honest. Well, wonderful. Uh, so I I want to turn to some foreign affairs issues because I think that these are you know pressing it on people's minds. Sure. Uh, and then we can turn back a little bit uh, to the conversation you just laid there because I think it you know it speaks to you know, where the Emirates are going and what the future yeah. will bring. Uh, let me first ask you about Afghanistan um, mm -hmm. because it's a topic that weighs heavy I think on many people's minds. Uh, it's a country where your country, uh, the Emirates, have invested a lot. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to see the sacrifices that your uh, countrymen made personally. Um, with, you know, the Emirati Special Forces spent years yeah. living in Afghan villages, working with local communities, building their economies, their political yeah. systems. You know, a wonderful sacrifice. Um, and more recently, the Emirates played a leading role in the uh, the escapees. You know, the uh, taking the evacuation of folks out of Afghanistan, and most mm -hmm. recently have started pushing humanitarian assistance into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, what do you see um, as UAE's commitment to Afghanistan going forward? 
Uh, I think um, well, we, obviously we've been mo monitoring Afghanistan since the, since the uh, late eighties, um, and you know we've had well early eighties to be honest, um, and we've also witnessed kind of the breakdown of Afghanistan and the rise of Islamic extremism, whether that was Al Qaeda going back to the nineteen nineties, uh, early two thousands, uh, and then and the, and the Taliban. Um, you know, we've we've come out uh, very strongly in the last few years um, in favor of a, a more diverse understanding of religion, a more tolerant approach to uh, uh, outsiders, the you know from from our own community, um, and we're really making uh, concrete. We're taking con concrete steps to clarify that that is our moral and ethical position as a as a state and as a, as a and as community in the Emirates. So um, to to see what's happening today in Afghanistan, um, you know. It was n not desired, not expected, um, and uh, some, something of a surprise. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it's an ancient society, and it's 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 uh, not to be expected that you can you know change something like that overnight. Uh, we're very very concerned about women's issues and women's rights uh, in in Afghanistan, um, and I think uh, we've we've been consistent about the promotion of uh, women within Islamic societies. Um, and you know, you can see from the uh, experience of the Emirates, we have you know so many. Uh, uh, senior figures in the, in the government and in, uh, in civil society who are uh, female and they're promoted um, and, and protected in that sphere. So for us to see this um, turning around, turning back in the name of Islam uh, from you know, sort of women's education or women's role in public life, uh, it's extremely disappointing. And you know, we, we, we will do whatever we can to encourage the, uh, the authorities uh, in, in Afghanistan to rethink and reconsider. And you know, of course, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money um, assisting in the evacuation of uh, uh, foreigners uh, from Afghanistan and, and Afghans who have the right to leave, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's only part of what we hope we can do. Uh, and you know, ultimately, we'd love to see uh, Afghanistan being a you know, kind of a prosperous country, uh, taking taking real care of its natural resources and its uh, and its um, human potential. Uh, and I think over the last twenty years, its human potential has really been able to uh, shine, shine forth. Uh, and it's so unfortunate that uh, the current authorities can't see that um, as as a blessing, as opposed to some form of uh, a, a curse. Yeah, I will say the you know when I worked with your uh, your Emirati forces, one of the things that they provided for the NATO mission was you know an ability to com you know communicate with local communities, you know sure. to be sort of a, an authority on Islam. I mean, yeah. do you see a public diplomacy role for the Emirates? In Afghanistan, or is it too soon right now to answer that question? I'd say, yeah, it is, it is a bit too soon. Um, also, we've taken quite a, a, a change in our approach to, um, you know, regional issues over the last couple of years. Uh, I think COVID, COVID um, had an effect, uh, but also, you know, sort of the developments across the region. We've um, now uh, decided to focus much more on our internal security on our economic growth within. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to solve the problems of the region and, and of the world, uh, but you know, we're actually finding that uh, our our attention is probably better focused inwards at the moment. Um, we'll still, of course, continue to do our 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 part as um, uh, members of the international community. Um, we're very very keen on you know supporting multilateral institutions, and we're very keen also on supporting smaller states like ourselves. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if your your um, viewers know. Um, but you know we're we're taking our seat at the Security Council um, in the next few months, uh, and this is also you know it's a, it's a huge obligation and it's a huge responsibility. So our focus will be on trying to represent uh, well both the Arab world uh, and and you know the smaller states that face many of the sim similar issues that we face. So uh, we'll be trying to support as much as possible that multilateral kind of approach to to problem solving. Um, hmm. Okay, and that's a great transition to the. Next question, which is the about the Abraham Accords. Yeah. Um, as uh, many in the audience will likely know, uh, the, the Abraham Accords celebrated its first anniversary, I think, uh, just two weeks ago on mm -hmm. September 15th. And for those that don't know, uh, the Abraham Accords was a, you know, a what I, you know, I think of it as the first major movement, you know, positive movement forward towards peace in the Middle East in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, it was led by Israel and the United Arab Emirates, you know, working together over many years uh, to you know, sign a, a, a pact of political and economic normalization. Um, so question for you, Ambassador. Most of the discussion around the Abraham Accords has focused on the economic benefits. Um, and in passing, people mentioned people-to-people -people opportunities. 
And I'm yeah. wondering if you could speak a bit more about what that means uh, to you and what it means to the Abraham Accords. Yeah, uh, I, I've noticed also that there's a great deal of focus on you know, the economic benefits and the economic prospects uh, and the amount of trade that's going to take place. And, and that is all very important and very, and you know, it shows a sign of optimism and desire, you know, kind of provides goals to work for. Uh, I, I my, myself, I mean, I, I have a better understanding perhaps or, than some of your viewers on how, how we operate as investors. I, I know for a fact that you know a lot of our um, you know, kind of, um, private sector investors, you know, they, they know their market and they like their market and you know they feel more comfortable uh, at home. So the idea that all of a sudden there's going to be a massive amount of investment abroad into Israel, uh, potentially, but I, I don't think it's particularly likely. There's there's probably going to be an investment you know at the at the personal level into real estate you know uh, in in Israel. I think there's a lot of curiosity um, in terms of tourism. Uh, and you know we're we're, uh, uh, we're nomads uh, by nature uh, and and traders by sea uh, as well historically, uh, and so we're always very curious uh, about what's uh, about places that we haven't been uh, allowed to go into before. So I know that, I mean I speak to uh, Emiratis all the time, and we're always saying you know who's going next, yeah? uh, and I'm planning a trip to Israel fairly soon as well. Um, I think uh, on the people-to-people -people front, so on the economic front, um, we have the private sector, which may or may not uh, take up the, the challenge. Uh, but then we have the sovereign wealth funds that have a um, more strategic approach to uh, investment. And there are two or three strategic um, investments that will, will take place, I'm sure. Uh, this, there's been the investment into the gas fields with Delek, uh, and then there's you know G42, which is a, a technology company based out of Abu Dhabi, which is then looking at technological partnerships. So they will they will be the driving force on on those kinds of of investments, and and you know they will clearly they will be sizable. Uh, but will they have that kind of cultural effect um, that you know we would hope that that, that takes place? Uh, and I think it's on the as you say the people to people side. Um, you're going to see, I think, more impact than on these like large scale investments. Uh, and the impact will be, well, we've already got students, Emirati students who are now studying in, uh, in Israeli universities. Um, I know that there are a lot of Emirati students who want to study Hebrew. Um, I was actually uh, giving some advice to a friend of mine a couple of days ago. He wanted a, a website that he could go on to, to, to learn Hebrew. So I'm like, okay, I, I hear you all. Um, so there's the tourism, there's the, uh, uh, on the, on the cultural sphere, I think what's going to happen with the, the start of the expo, um, there's, there's going to be, well, I mean, there's obviously an Israeli pavilion there, uh, and that's going to be a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to, as Emiratis, come and see what Israel is like uh, at home, uh, and that's, uh, that's very exciting. I think also we've got, as you know, we've, um, we've got the Abraham, uh, Abrahamic family house. Uh, which is a, a complex of a, a church, a synagogue, and a mosque coming up in, in Abu Dhabi. And I think there, I mean, you know, we might even find that there's a form of religious tourism taking place. Uh, that should be fun. We also have a, 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 a separate from the Israeli uh, component, we've got a large uh, or growing uh, Jewish community, whether it's a permanently based one or it's, it's a transient community of tourists coming in from Israel or from, you know, the Soviet, ex Soviet Union. Uh, and there are a number of now Jewish communities uh, being, you know, kind of formed. Uh, one at least is more orthodox. One is uh, a little more liberal. Uh, and you know, they're, they're continually coming into contact with with Emiratis. So I, I'm I'm very optimistic on the people to people front. And I actually think that that is uh, probably the most important element of the Abraham Accords. Uh, and I think you know we've we've faced criticism um, and you know sort of a downplaying of the importance of the Accords uh, that you know it didn't solve the Palestinian issue. Well, it didn't solve the Palestinian issue because the Palestinian issue is an extremely complex issue, uh, but it is a stepping stone towards uh, changing perceptions of what is possible in the Middle East, uh, what can be expected of Muslims and Arabs, what is uh, reasonable for Muslims and Arabs to do in, in the quest for peace. Um, and also it opens the door to actually creating um, uh, more points of contact for the Israelis in the region to understand what are real concerns and what are perhaps you know hyped up concerns. So. I'm, uh, uh, I'm, you know, to, for, for me personally, to see the Abraham Accords uh, uh, being signed last year was uh, a huge moral victory, uh, I think, um, in in a fight uh, against hatred uh, and in particular against anti-Semitism. So um, I would ask your viewers to reconsider uh, and perhaps uh, pay more attention to how the Abraham Accords can play out rather than, you know, seeing it as you know, an immediate result.
this is a platform on which we can all build. And I would say, you know, on the economic side, you know, we've at Rand, we've done a bit of analysis and it's it's clear that progress is being made and we think the economic potential is really, really large. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. You know, I do think sure. that there are people that are, you know, saying it's not such a big deal. But um, so one of the one of the challenges that are uh, concerns that's often raised is the Palestinian issue. Yeah. Um, and your colleague, the former Emirati foreign minister, if I'm right, uh, Dr. Yeah. Bardash, said last week, and this is what, you know, this is his quote, uh, that the Abraham Accords would allow us to help and assist further in the peace process, leading yep. to what we all see as the ultimate goal of a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. You know, so for the viewers, how do you, how do the Emirates see the Abraham Accords as helping support a two-state solution? Uh, I think it's just opening up that idea of what we can do in the Middle East, um, because we've lived, at least for, for, for my lifetime, we've lived on the, these very, very heavy taboos that, you know, we would not be able to recognize Israel, even even on a map. I mean, we don't we wouldn't produce our own maps. We'd import maps from the West. And if there was the, the name Israel was on it, we would, you know, the censors would, would scratch it out. Uh, I think, uh, you know, also when it comes to understanding um, the the. Um, Concerns of Israelis, the security concerns of Israelis, I think it's exceptionally important for us to understand the experience of the Holocaust, for example. Uh, and I, uh, I was just, I'm in Los Angeles and I visited the Simon uh, Wiesenthal Center and the Museum of Tolerance. And, you know, it really occurred to me that it just shows how human we all are and how we're all fallible and how um, the question of tolerance actually concerns every one of us. So there was a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, amount to, to, to learn there. I think uh, the idea that we have broken through a massive taboo and we're actually saying that we uh, in the Arab world, uh, though uh, we uh, support um, you know, sort of group ideals, we also are nations with our sovereignty. So the signing of the Abraham Accords, for me, uh, I read it as a very clear signal that we're taking a step as a sovereign state uh, with full agency and with full responsibility for the consequences. Uh, and rather than falling into kind of rhetorical um, uh, arguments uh, or accusatory arguments, uh, we should actually think, okay, well, we have taken the step, other countries are taking the step. How do we now demonstrate that, you know, uh, genuine results can be uh, attained? Um, and things don't happen overnight. We need to keep pushing. And we, without doubt, we will continue to support two-state solution and uh, justice for the Palestinians. Um, but things are things are based on a compromise, um, and uh, it's it's something that we need to keep pushing. You talked earlier about the uh, importance of multilateral engagement, uh, yeah. and one thing you know, the Abraham Accords. Yes, you know, Israel and the UAE were at the heart of the Abraham Accords, but yeah. at its heart, my understanding was it was always intended to be a multilateral agreement. Um, so I was wondering if you yeah. could speak a bit about the other signatories to the accords, uh, particularly Morocco and Sudan, um, which yeah. were part of the initial accords, and what progress is being made with them in terms of you know, deepening cultural, economic, political relations, and then also the potential for other, you know, other nations around the globe to join. Um, you know, people floated other possible countries as possible yeah. signatories. You know, is there progress being made there? Are we going to see an expansion geographically of this over the next, you know, five to yeah. ten years? Uh, you know, I, I can't really speak for other other countries, but I will say that um, I, just thinking about this issue over the last few days, uh, there's a reason why uh, I believe that the focus on the Abraham Accords is on the accord between the Emirates and and Israel, and I think it's because well, the Emirates is a country that's in a hurry. Uh, it's in a hurry to to make progress. It's in a hurry to um, uh, develop its economy. Um, we have very, very bold targets. The whole of the government uh, infrastructure that we have is KPI oriented. Uh, you know, uh, every time I speak in public, I get to tick another uh, box uh, as having having performed my duties. There are not many countries in the Middle East that that, that uh, operate that way, and there are very few governments that operate that way. I'd say in the Middle East. So, um, and you know, uh, uh, there are countries in the Middle East that potentially would want to sign a deal with Israel, but they have so many internal issues. Um, where the, the, they may not be able to face that taboo uh, just so straightforwardly. Um, and so again, we're, we're, we're lucky that we have leadership that is uh, very forward thinking, uh, but not only forward thinking, I leave that to one side, that is actually much more concerned about the health uh, of our economy and our society uh, than perhaps other countries. Um, and you know, reaching out to Israel, uh, 
there's a, there's a good reason apart from tolerance and peace. It's because Israel really is a powerhouse of, of uh, intellectual kind of uh, uh, development and, and uh, academic excellence and, and technological uh, kind of um, excellence. And so, you know, the Emirates it sees itself as a, as a global node. Um, and it needs to connect with other nodes as well. Um, we connected with the, you know, so the U.S. and the West. Uh, we connected with the, the Indians and with the Chinese, and and uh, we need to connect with the Israelis too. Um, there is, apart from you know the idealism, there are um, very serious uh, reasons why we should connect with them. Increases just the global. One, yeah, yeah, just one last question on the accords. Uh, sure. Do you think that they offer the potential for enhancing regional security? Uh, well, I think it's up to us to push uh, for that. I mean, we, we are still working out the details of the accord between ourselves and the Israelis. Um, I think uh, the a greater economic ties is going to help. Uh, I think greater understanding of each other's positions is going to help. The fact that we can now pick up the phone and speak to each other about regional uh, questions um, is, is exceptionally important. And, you know, uh, I was also, I, I, was, I was recently having a discussion with a senior official about this. Um, my question to him was, you know, how how does it differ speaking, for, you know, to uh, when you when you pick up the phone, you speak to an Arab colleague or you pick up the phone, and you speak to a Western colleague. What is the difference in, in tone? How, how how much openness is there and how much kind of cooperation is there? And I think in, in our part of the world, the Emirates being a country that wants to work with others, understands the benefits of working with others. We will we will respond positively to open uh, openness and clarity. Uh, and that's going to get us much further. So I think the Israelis should understand that as well, that openness and clarity is going to be a great way to build uh, relations in the, in the region. All right. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about uh, the first 50 years of, of the UAE, um, which yeah. you know overlap with your, your own 50 years. Uh, yes. What do you see, what do you think is going to happen over the next 25 years? What are the major changes you see in the Emirates and in your region over the next 25 years? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to lose about 20 pounds um, and uh, to celebrate my 75th birthday with you. <laughs> uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see a really interesting kind of development of um, regional relations. People are gonna begin to recognize increasingly that um, the government is there to serve the people. And uh, you, you, you can serve a, a, the people even if you're in a, in what, what you might call a monarchy. Um, and you can you can have tremendous concern for uh, the health of your society. Uh, so I think there's gonna be, uh, at least in the Emirates, we're looking at a, a really remarkable future ahead of us and we're all sort of uh, focused on building it. And that, you know, again, it comes to, uh, it actually starting off with physical health, uh, we're looking at the question of mental health, which which is an issue that is hugely, again, taboo in the, in the, in the Middle East and in Arab society. Um, this is, you know, the subject that's being openly discussed. Uh, recognition that we live in a globalized world and that we need to play uh, according to those rules, um, but also to set incredibly high standards, um, and that there are no favors uh, that we're going to be able to, to to call in or, or call on. Um, and you know, this is something that I'm I'm teaching my children and that and uh, friends of ours are teaching their children, is that you can sort of talk about national pride, you can talk about you know ethnicity and purity of line and tribal affiliation. But actually, we live in a global economy, and you're going to have to really get your act together. Uh, so we tell our kids, compete with the best in the world. Don't compete with your neighbor. Um, and you know, once we see that kind of logic being spread across the, the Middle East, and I think you can see it already happening in places like Saudi Arabia, um, certainly Qatar and Bahrain. Uh, Egypt is looking uh, fascinating in terms of its you know, kind of uh, technological uh, startup scene and, and so on. I think there's going to be, uh, I mean, we're, we're optimists about the Middle East. Um, and we're optimists partly because we take responsibility for our own uh, society and economy, uh, but also because we are very happy to share our experiences with, um, you know, sort of fellow governments across the region. So not just in the Middle East, but you know, even Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Central Asia. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a healthy economy, healthy society, um, and uh, we, we have KPIs to make us the number one nation in the world. So uh, we're going to get there. Yeah, on the uh, on the economic question, I'm an economist, yeah. so I'm always uh, yes. biased a little bit in that direction. One of the things people yeah. are warning us is that in the next 25 years, we're going to see the end of hydrocarbons. You know, by yes. 2015, the hydrocarbon era will be over. You know, they'll still be around. Yeah. Um, you know, and Abu Dhabi will probably still be selling it, but the revenue will be much less significant. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you think do you think you guys are ready? Uh, today, no, I don't think we're ready. Uh, I think um, I think mentally we're ready. I think uh, in terms of kind of uh, forecasting, we uh, are very very uh, clear about um, the realities out there. Uh, we will maximize. I know we're going to maximize our, our uh, potential profits from hydrocarbons going forward. But at the same time, we're going to do our, our, our utmost to minimize the uh, effect on, on climate and the environment. Um, but we also, I mean, I can tell you just simply in, in, in terms of being a, a government bureaucrat, uh, there have been massive cuts uh, across the federal government. And the reality is, is that we've become more efficient. Uh, and uh, that's that's a superb thing. We just become more efficient. Um, and and actually, those who are proposing more efficient measures uh, get more of a hearing now as well. Um, uh, it, it it allows us to tap into young people's aspirations. Um, they begin to feel that hey, maybe I have a, a purpose in in the office. Uh, that wasn't the case when I was in my twenties. Um, at the time, the, the the social contract essentially was well, you've got a government job, enjoy it, right? You know, um, have a have a cigarette, have a ha, have a cup of tea. Uh, today we don't have that uh, environment, and it's fantastic. So, uh, I think we uh, also, uh, if you look at the, the various emirates, I mean, Abu Dhabi is the hydrocarbon rich emirate, and and it has its own challenges in terms of being cursed with natural resources. But the other emirates are not so endowed. And you might look at Dubai as an example of what you can do when you have no natural resources, and that is to use your ingenuity as a natural resource. Uh, I think that's exactly what's happening um, in Dubai and then uh, across the smaller Emirates, which um, unexpectedly are actually doing much better um, than, than people might have imagined uh, 20 years ago. Well, I might uh, close this out and then we could turn to questions, but let me close out by returning back to your book. And it's, uh, again, you cover many themes, but the I think the overarching theme is this, quite, this story about tolerance. Yeah. And, Overall, you know, how do you create tolerance? How do you teach the youth tolerance? I mean, I think you, yeah. you reflect on your own personal experience growing up and uh, the experience of your son uh, watching yeah. him grow up. You know, what, you know, if, if you could talk briefly about you know, the key observations that you've had, but then also yeah. what are the pragmatic steps that we can take? You know, we can take here in the West, yeah. uh, that the United States can take. Again, you know, this is a challenge. You know, I, have, I have small children, yeah. a little bit younger than yours, um, but this is yeah. something that I'm looking forward to, these challenges going forward. So you know, what would be your lessons and what's your vision, if you will, for a region that's more tolerant and more understanding? Uh, good question. Uh, it's a question that I, I, I think about uh, quite often. Um, you know, recently we celebrated, um, we, we, we celebrated the year of tolerance in the Emirates. Um, and it was very interesting because it, it brought forth the uh, kind of it, it underlined the, the value of tolerance. Uh, um, but one, one thing that I noticed was that we weren't fully developing these ideas around tolerance. So it was basically a marker um, saying, OK, yes, we are tolerant. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the practical example of the Emirates is one of tolerance uh, and openness and, and you know, sort of reliance on trade. But we hadn't really kind of theorized it. Uh, and I, uh, I did come across a, a couple of comments uh, online, which were very Im important, which was um, basically, what are the limits of our tolerance? If we tolerate everybody and everything, then have we not lost our own identity? Um, and so, yeah, it, it, for me, it, it becomes a question of, okay, I am tolerant, but at, at some stage, I need to still maintain kind of the vessel of my, my, my personality and my, and my body. Um, and I found it very interesting over the last couple of days when I visited the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles uh, to find that actually the first half of the experience um, didn't touch on, on religion or ethnicity at all. Uh, it was one where the focus was on understanding that there is not only your perspective, but other perspectives. Uh, and they do this you know, with, with social media, no, sorry, visual media in a very, very smart way. Uh, and then the structuring of arguments around contentious issues. One thing, you know, one argument can seem incredibly reasonable until you hear the countering argument, which can also be very reasonable. Uh, and just having that happen um, uh, to me was really eye opening because these are almost technical measures to underline how uh, tolerance can be developed uh, or, or your attention can be brought to it. So I was actually thinking that that might be a great idea uh, to, to, to bring back home uh, and to create, you know, these experiences where uh, you, you see what it's like. Um, also, we, you know, we, we do have we do have this these uh, very important ideas of national pride and ethnic pride, um, and and the question is how do you tone that down so that it isn't um, uh, vicious or vindictive or 
angry, uh, but it can be celebrated along with the pride of others. Uh, and I think what we're doing, um, you know, with the with the construction of, for example, a Hindu temple in in Abu Dhabi, uh, and and synagogues sprouting up all over the over the the Emirates, uh, it's an important way of showing that it's normalizing the presence of others. Uh, and then, you know, the outreach of these different communities into the Arab and Muslim communities has been very important as well. Uh, I think it's 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 difficult to hate somebody when they're so friendly. Um, and it, it forces you to, to rethink your, your, your stand, whether it's so necessary to be you know, so aggressive. So you know, these are just a few impressions that I've, I've gathered over the last few days, which are really valuable for me. Well, wonderful. Jessica, uh, I might turn it back to you uh, for questions from the listeners. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel and uh, Ambassador Gabash. Uh, before we launch into the Q&A session, I would like to thank our members and viewers for your continued support. We depend upon your donations and membership to cover our expenses so that we can continue to bring you these important discussions. If you are able to make a donation, please go to our website, lawacth.org, and click on the donate button or become a member. We greatly appreciate it. All right, let's jump into these questions. All right, uh, Ambassador Gabash, how have the recent elections in Iran changed the dynamics in the greater Gulf region? Uh Good question. I, I think you know the. I think it's 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 probably more the Biden position on the uh, nuclear agreement that has changed the uh, the dynamics in the region. I don't think that we have any great expectations uh, for Iranian uh, democracy. Uh, you know, we know we know that it's a very limited field. Uh, the candidates can you know have to have to pass all kinds of stringent tests. Um, uh, but we have we have actually reached out to the Iranians and we have congratulated their president on his uh, his election, uh, and, and and to be honest, I mean you know the the, the winds of change are in the region, um, and so we have um, uh, paid visits to Iran. We've looked at you know sort of previously unfriendly countries such as uh, Qatar and Turkey, uh, and you know we are we are making uh, pragmatic changes in our policies towards all of these countries. Um, of course, in the expectation that they will uh, also respect our interests uh, and, our, and our sovereignty and integrity. Um, so uh, we are, I suppose, are, are, are biding our time, uh, like many other countries, but we are also making sure that we have um, uh, as, as, as good relations as possible uh, in the meantime. Thank you. Your bio shows that you're very involved in the arts. How do you see arts and culture influencing the modern Islamic world? And what is the response by more fundamentalist Muslims to modern art? Uh, yeah, well, I think like many of us, they don't understand modern art. Uh, I, I think, look, what happened in the in the Emirates is that um, because we had such an influx of, of, of different nationalities, uh, a lot of people kind of reacted to this um, this influx in, in different ways. You know, so culture is upset, uh, culture is kind of uh, scratched and irritated, and all of a sudden this leads to a, a, an outpouring of expression. Uh, and if you look at a place like Dubai, which has a very, very dynamic uh, cosmopolitan community, um, we have a, a lot of artistic production there, which is which is absolutely fabulous. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it, it, uh, there are you know, norms change. Uh, and there was a time uh, in neighboring countries in the 50s and 60s where, and even, in, uh, even up to the late 80s and 90s, where the, the, the idea of uh, representation was, uh, was not accepted. Um, but, you know, um, modern technology, uh, the desire to participate in, in, in the modern world uh, allows you to kind of well, break down the uh, integrity or the coherence of those positions. Uh, and so increasingly, these places are producing really remarkable works, uh, very introspective, very revealing works. Uh, I know that, I mean, the Saudis are very interesting, uh, interested in promoting their own art scene, um, and they have this huge focus on, on you know, the creative economy uh, and tourism, looking at um, ancient artifacts that don't necessarily gel 100% with an Islamist interpretation of history. Uh, I think that we're, across the Arab world, there is more of an interest um, in our own heritage, you know, and our own uh, rather rather than constructed and imagined heritage, the the actual r reality of our heritage. So, um, just looking at you know the the uh, there are Jewish uh, tombstones in the uh, Northern Emirates. Um, there's a church that was discovered uh, from I think it was about 600 A.D. Uh, on one of the islands in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I mean, you know, art and religion are, are so intertwined in our in our um, part of the world that these are important kind of uh, markers. 
This next questioner says, I would be interested in the ambassador's position on the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Also, I hope he might be on the combatants for peace tour this November. I, okay, on, on very specific technical questions, I am not the person to speak to. Uh, uh, again, you know, we, we, we want to we wanna see uh, justice for Palestinians uh, uh, in, uh, inside uh, Israel proper and outside. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that um, I think one of the one of the uh, this is kind of a, a tangent to that question. One of the very interesting kind of aspects of the Palestinian Israeli um, uh, issue is the position of uh, Palestinian Israelis who, uh, you know, there's one and a half million people. And in the debates across the Arab world, nobody's ever heard their voices. And I think they would provide a very interesting perspective on what it means to be a part of the Israeli state. And yet, or rather, Israeli nation, and yet also a part of the Arab and Muslim world. I think uh, just on the subject of tolerance, that might, you know, crack open some some very interesting uh, ideas. Uh, on on being part of this tour, uh, I would happily uh, join, um, but I, I have to get permission of my boss. Um, so send me the invite, and I'll see if I can join. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, well, Russia is in the news a lot in uh, the United States. So can you discuss your experience as ambassador to Russia? What is the relationship with the UAE and Russia, and how does that complicate relations with the US? Oh, I don't think it complicates relations at all. Uh, I've always been uh, very consistent uh, about this. Our relationship with uh, the United States is, uh, it's part of our identity. Um, and I hope the you know, Americans understand that. It really is part of our identity. We've had so many students uh, come to the US to study. Um, this is where they've had their formative experiences. Um, they've, you know, sort of acquired so many of the different kind of uh, cultural markers of being uh, in the U.S. Um, my, sorry, apologies for that. I got excited. Uh, my siblings all studied in the U.S. I was an Anglophile until I got to England, um, uh, but it was too late by then. So I, I got a British education. Um, but you know, my 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 oldest son is studying in the United States. So um, there is nothing that really competes with the U.S. in in the region in the Gulf states. Um, you can have technical, uh, you can have friendly political relations with the Russians and the Chinese and, and, and so many other, but the cultural force of the U.S. is something that uh, cannot be competed with. Um, so uh, whatever whatever I did in Russia um, was, uh, there, 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 there were a couple of things. I mean, you know, you need to work with uh, countries on um, uh, intelligence cooperation, uh, particularly, you know, in, in, in the time of ISIS and uh, the, the situation in Syria and, and the rise of radical Islam and so on. Um, and, and I always made the argument that um, Russia had uh, points of leverage across the Middle East uh, because they, they, they had, you know, I mean, their foreign ministry is very, very uh, Arab Arabist. Um, and uh, they really do have uh, very important networks that we have managed to tap into and, and to focus, uh, well, to work with. Um, does it? I, I really don't see the relationship with with Russia or or China as as a threat to our relationship with the U.S. And um, we, as I say, we have very good relations with those countries. But the cultural aspect, the cultural angle of our relationship with the U.S. is uh, is immovable. So that's a good thing. Yeah. What role do you think science diplomacy will play in the United Arab Emirates' future? Well, uh, since I've just been given um, uh, the uh, the responsibility for um, handling science and technology policy within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I think it's going to play a huge future, a huge role in the future. Um, we're, we're actually working with a number of our ministries. Um, so the Ministry of uh, Advanced Technology and Industry, the Ministry of Food Security, Climate Change, um, Digital Economy and Artificial Intelligence on, um, we're, we're working on activating our network of uh, diplomats um, uh, abroad. Uh, now we have diplomats in 100 countries. Um, and we're, we're reaching out to industry associations, to universities, to governments, uh, to um, maximize the possible uh, involvement of their scientific and entrepreneurial communities in, in the Emirates. Uh, and again, you know, we provide the, the Emirates provides a fantastic kind of a platform and a hub uh, and, a, and a connector uh, with many different parts of the world. Um, and we've seen, you know, quite uh, over over the course of COVID, we've seen uh, quite a large influx of technology entrepreneurs into the Emirates uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and it's almost as though we're creating a kind of a, a cluster of, of of people as opposed to institutions or, or companies. So I, I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think it's going to be 
uh, well, like everything good, it's going to be uphill. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but uh, there is a huge amount of uh, potential there. I think you know that we, we, we're, we're quite keen on our um, uh, space exploration. Uh, and so we've sent, uh, you, you know, that we've sent a um, probe to Mars and uh, it's uh, collecting data at the moment. Uh, there's a big focus in government on supporting STEM subjects, uh, so the sciences. We have a lot of students who are now studying the sciences abroad. Uh, and we're also developing local universities, um, uh, you know, in cooperation with uh, Western universities, or, and uh, in one case, with even with the Chinese. Um, so there's a big, big focus on on uh, leveraging uh, technology and and really kind of creating uh, an intellectual base within the Emirates. Uh, and it, it includes, I have to say, very importantly, that you know we've moved as a society from being very uh, Emirati oriented to being oriented towards the community of the Emirates. So we we now treat uh, everybody as a member of uh, as part of the community of the Emirates uh, within you know within the country. It's um, so we're we're providing a lot of support to anybody who's creative and innovative and hardworking. How is the UAE working toward more democracy? Yeah, good question as well. Um, and we uh, we well we've certainly got uh, a, a number of institutions that. Um, demonstrate uh, democratic tendencies and that's uh, you know the federal national council and within each emirate there are uh, uh, different councils as well uh we you know we're more of a traditional society and you know, the uh, i think what what we've seen of a, a technical approach to no democracy um hasn't really kind of encouraged us to be that uh that focused on the technicalities um and so i mean one example is the parliament of of a uh, neighboring country kuwait and Kuwait has been in, in different, you know, in different ways, it's uh, not been able to um, achieve the same kind of economic progress that we have, and partly because of, you know, sort of logjam in, in the, uh, or stalemate in, in, in their parliament. Um, and so we recognize that there is, we have our, what we call the Medjlis system, which is a system whereby, you know, uh, people will come into a, a large room, where there'll be a large discussion, uh, but we're also a very consensus-oriented society by, you know, by, by tradition, uh, and consensus-oriented societies tend to be also follow the leader. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, uh, had we had a, uh, a kind of a referendum on peace with Israel, I doubt that it would have happened. However, once the decision was made, uh, you get support for things like that. So I think it's it's a long-term uh, it's a long-term uh, approach. Uh, where we balance uh, the stability of our society uh, uh, with, uh, you know, kind of the aspirations of, of pretty much everybody. What are your thoughts and concerns about the young Muslims that are seeing the Taliban now, who appear to be more savvy on social media and being acknowledged by global leaders? Uh, I don't know about the young young Muslims. I mean, I, I must admit, I was a bit surprised um, at how quickly the international media started referring to the Taliban as the new government, the incoming government, and you know, we're looking to see their their cabinet kind of makeup and are they going to stick to their words? And you know, they have now a spokesperson. So there was almost a, kind of a, a legitimization of the Taliban even before they came into power. Uh, I, uh, you know, it's early days. I mean, things are not looking particularly optimistic on uh, on, on what they're doing. Simply uh, with, with the prevention of women going to university or teaching in universities, and, and the issue of uh, girls getting an education, uh, you know, that is not very promising, uh, to be honest. Uh, and you know, whether they're going to be media savvy, uh, what, what is what is the program that they're presenting? Uh, I don't think that um, political Islam has. Uh, succeeded over the last 20 years in demonstrating um, it, it, its benefits to uh, young young Muslims and young Arabs uh, in particular. How is the UAE government dealing with the thorny issue in some corners of climate change? Uh, gosh, yeah, that's a, um, I think, well, we're, we will be hosting the COP uh, conference um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a couple of years, actually, yeah. Um, so we're very keen on this subject. Um, we have a very forceful climate change uh, envoy um, who uh, headed up the renewable energies uh, center that we set up in 2006. Uh, it's uh, it's exceptionally important for us as a country, um, simply because you know uh, it's already very very hot. Uh, we don't need it to be any hotter. 
Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with other countries on figuring out um, how, to, how to move towards a, a kind of a renewable space. We've made huge investments across the world in renewable energy, uh, not just in the Emirates. I think we have the largest renewable energy solar power plant uh, in, in the world. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm also responsible in my job for our, our relationship with Central America and the Caribbean. And, you know, we have um, many, many different projects there setting up, um, you know, sort of uh, renewable energy uh, operations. So um, we, are, we are very committed to it, uh, but there's a, there's a limit, uh, you know, that we can do as a small country. Um, sorry, my questions just jumped around. Will the United Arab Emirates provide transparency and openly welcome representatives of international human rights organizations? Uh, we have a, we've actually we just set up a human rights um, uh, institution in the Emirates, uh, which is headed by our ex Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Anwar Gargash. Uh, I think the, the, the reality is is that we're going to want to um, make sure that the view of our human rights situation is as objective as possible uh, and that's not to you know sort of suggest that um these human rights organizations are, are not objective uh, but we want to be able to say look this is where we are this is what we've done uh, we take these issues extremely seriously uh now we're also a society that tends not to take public criticism too well and that you know is potentially a cultural issue um you know. Uh, so many of the many of the disagreements that you'll find across the Arab world are expressed privately and not publicly, um, and it, it's 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 less of an adversarial system uh, than than perhaps the Western organizations like. Uh, we we do, as I say, we do continue to take the, these issues very very seriously. How have the Abraham Accords evolved with the new Biden administration? You know something, I think that the, the, the Abraham Accords are our accords with the Israelis, right? I mean, these are our agreement with the Israelis. And I don't think that a change in U.S. administration or a change in tone or a change in kind of enthusiasm is going to change our enthusiasm and our commitment to uh, the accords. And I think I've spoken to some uh, is, is Israeli friends about this, and they said, you know, is this going to change? Is this, Are you going to re renege on these agreements? Uh, no, we, we made a sovereign decision. Uh, and that sovereign decision will will remain. Um, you know, we in in a sense we've already paid the the, the price up front in in terms of breaking a taboo. Um, and we're not we're certainly not going to turn back on that now. Thank you. Uh, what are the Emirates doing about Yemen? Okay, so the Yemen um, uh, has always been a difficult issue. Um, you know, over the years we've pumped uh, billions of dollars into um, supporting. Uh, civil society in Yemen and providing uh, aid. Um, we were involved militarily with the, the Saudis in Yemen, but we uh, withdrew, I think it's about two years ago now. Um, and we continue to provide aid as we can. Uh, our concern is for, for a stable Yemen and for a peaceful Yemen, and a Yemen that actually represents a little more uh, rather than the the, the healthy government uh, represents its uh, diverse um, uh, groups uh, properly. Thank you. Thinking back to the Arab Spring, how much has the ground shifted in the Middle East since? That's also very, these are very good questions. Uh, we have smart Arab audience Spring. members. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, there's a certain perspective that says that the Arab Spring cost the Arab world, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in kind of wasted resources. Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. I mean, there's you know the the, the change in government or the change in the situation in Tunisia. Um, uh, I think I think what the Arab Spring has done has has created a sense of urgency amongst leaders in the region on trying to find good solutions, uh, effective solutions, uh, solutions where our uh, society and the economy will catch up with our demography. Um, I think uh, there's much greater awareness of uh, aspirations right what do people really want how can governments uh provide uh, a sense of meaning uh or get, at least get out of the way in in, in in other people's efforts to find a sense of meaning um so you know the the, the i personally i don't think that the uh, the arab springs record was brilliant um and uh i don't know i think uh, in the emirates um we are trying to design a system that allows for all of the particularities of the Arab world and the Middle East, um, uh, but at the same time allows for a connection with a global kind of mindset 
Um, so health, uh, education, uh, opportunity, um, these are the things that we're really focused on. And we would hope that you know they focus on in other parts of the Arab world as well. Yeah. This will be my final question, and then um, I'll have Daniel come back. Some governments in the Middle East repress free speech and dissent of any kind. Is the United Arab Emirates' freedom to dissent limited or boundless? No, certainly not boundless. Um, and I, I've, I've spent a lot of time also thinking about this over the last 10 years. Uh, speech has a different effect in different places. And when you think of, of deep kind of tribal affiliations, and just to give you an example, we, we have a, a contest uh, for poetry in, in the region. And the poet who wins usually is the one not who's the best poet, uh, but who has most tribe members voting for him. So people are very tribal uh, at a kind of a deep level. And you, you, you can't just stand up and say things uh, as though you're the only individual in society and expect uh, no repercussions. And the repercussions can be terrible. Um, you know, with, with sufficient amounts of wrong speech, you can tear a country to, part, uh, to pieces. We, within the country, Within our society, we know what um, what the limits are in a sense. We know uh, what threatens the uh, social fabric, and uh, the threshold is much lower uh, in our part of the world to do that. And that's why, when we talk about free speech, we also talk about responsible speech because we know the consequences of what uh, uh, the consequences that our words carry. Um, and I, I'm not sure if people understand the the power of the Arabic language, and and you know, in particular in in, in Parts of the world where there are very few uh, resources uh, and all you've got are your wits about you, uh, <laughs> um, the, the destructive power of words, but also the constructive power of words. And uh, um, for the time being, we, we are still figuring our, out our way uh, in how we can express ourselves in a constructive manner in, in, a, in a very, very kind of uh, dynamic world. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of uh, the freest speech, but I'm also very much in favor of uh, making sure that we don't destroy ourselves in the process. Yeah, something our, our country is struggling with right now a little bit. So um, it's, a, it's a very thoughtful answer. Daniel, I want to have you come you. back if you can. And I actually have a question for you, Daniel, as well, from one of our audience members, if I can put him on the spot. Um, the question for you, Daniel, years ago, Rand did a plan for a two-state solution. Is it dead or do you hope to make it work with the UAE? That's a great question. Um, and we have, uh, I've not talked with the ambassador about it, so I don't want to put him on the spot. Uh, we did have a plan. It was a visionary plan called the ARC. I, uh, I know, I read it. It's, you know, I, I still think it's probably one of the most audacious uh, plans. You know, the Palestinians supported it um, yeah. at the time, and we had a price tag on it. The, the politics of getting it to work were always complicated. Um, and it's, you know, this is an area you know well, but certainly, you know, I, I think certainly would be something we'd love to promote again, because I, I think it is still viable, um, even given the political situation. And it's potentially the only viable solution that allows the creation of one Palestinian state um, without infringing at all on uh, Israeli territory. Um, so, uh, and just with that, you know, I just want to thank, I want to thank you. Uh, and thank uh, Ambassador Gabash. You know, I would hope we'd have a chance to talk about the third line. Um, my brother is a contemporary artist. He's a fine artist. This is why I have the donut over my shoulder. Um, he's a, uh, it's, it was deliberate. Um, I was hoping we could have a chance to talk about that, but maybe someday I can come visit the exhibition. Uh, Ooh, with pleasure. Please do. <laughs> awesome. Well, Daniel and uh, Ambassador Gabash, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. And I know this December, the UAE will be celebrating its golden jubilee. So we wish good things thank for you. all of you. And uh, yeah, hopefully as things open back up, we can we can host you here in person in Los Angeles. So thank you to both of you. And may I say, Daniel and Jessica, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, and uh, to all of your, you, your viewers, uh, thank you so much for having uh, given me the time to, to speak. And I hope I haven't upset or offended anybody un, un, unduly or unnecessarily. Thank <laughs> it's you not a good much. webinar if somebody isn't offended, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Uh, to, our, to our audience, if you'd like to support the council and programs like these and to learn about our upcoming events, please visit our website at lawacth.org. This Friday, we'll be hosting Professor Gordon Flake of the U.S. Uh, Asia Perth Center, and he'll be talking about the U.S.-Australia-U.K. deal that's happened recently and also, also our relationships with the uh, Australians in the Indo-Pacific. So tune into that. 
And thank you so much for joining us today and with all of your great questions. We hope to see you next time. Have a great day.